All right, so um, I've first of all called this course Aspects of Biblical Counseling. I haven't called it Introduction to Biblical Counseling. There's a, a reason that I haven't called it that, because it's not an introduction to biblical counseling, but it overlaps an introduction. So you are going to get introductory material, but you're going to get the kind of material uh, that uh, some introductions don't include, they, just because they don't have time to include it. So many of the things that we're going to be looking at will either overlap uh, these biblical counseling courses, but they will also, I think, uh, benefit you hopefully greatly because these are things that are very important but unfortunately are often not given the kind of time that they need to be given. I've always felt when uh, I've been uh, taking counseling courses or giving counseling courses that some of the things that we're going to deal with here are not dealt with in the kind of depth and with the kind of understanding that they need to be, because I think that they're crucial. Uh, so please don't think, therefore, that um, just because this is not an introduction to biblical counseling, that you're going to leave half prepared. That's not going to be the case. And the, the, the reason for that is because uh, God's truth is one. Okay, and what you learn here is going to kind of help you in your application in other areas of biblical counseling. Okay, so you will get sufficient material here to really make you uh, more proficient at doing this. And I hope that all of you will, you know, will, will pick up from this and, and really help others. <clears throat> Uh, you know, listen to others. Believe that God's truth, not, not you, it's not me, um, but God's truth, you know, your handling of God's truth, your, your sharing of God's truth, um, your willingness to um, be like Christ and be patient and listen. Today, some of the time, quite a lot of the time, is going to be taken up in just giving you a, a, an idea of why secular psychology and integrationist counseling is not biblical and is not right, okay? Uh, then we're going to go on to the actual the application of the biblical model. But by biblical, we mean principally two things, and I've written them down there for you. The first thing is that it's exegetical, which is a great big word that just means that it's taken out of the text of Scripture, okay? Taken out of the text of Scripture. So you look, you read the Bible, you read it in context, you read it for what it says, okay? Not what it says to you, but what it says objectively. And you take out of it those truths. And the Bible has a great deal to say about human beings and human problems, not surprisingly because it's authored by the person who made you. Uh, so it is the place to go to if we want to find out truth. Now, as we will see when we get down to the fall and, and uh, our sinful predispositions, because we're sinners, uh, even if we're redeemed sinners, we're still, you know, we still fight with the flesh, don't we? Because of that, some of, I might even say quite a lot of the things that the Bible tells us to do seem counterintuitive. Can you see that? They seem counterintuitive because our flesh is telling us, no, that's not going to work. That's not the right way to, to do it. Okay. And it is wisdom and humility to actually take God at what he says is the problem and deal with that, okay? So it takes listening to God, and in order to listen to God, we have to put God, make him God, and keep him as God. We have to make his word his word and keep it there. Otherwise, we're not going to do 
what it tells us to do. So that's the first thing, it's taken from the Bible. Secondly, it's also theologically sound. What I mean by theologically sound is that the Bible, the first thing that Bible is written for, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, is for doctrine, teaching, telling us what's so, what's not so. Okay? That the man of God would be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished for all good works. Do you see? That the first thing, after, you know, it's, it's good for reproof and instruction and, and all of that, but the first thing is doctrine. In fact, you can't, you can't reprove somebody with the Bible, you can't instruct somebody in righteousness from the Bible if they won't listen to its doctrine. Do you see? So that's why it has to come first. And doctrine is uh, understanding what the Bible says about God, what the Bible says about itself, what the Bible says about the world, and what the Bible says about the human heart. All right? So that's very, very important. That's what makes it biblical. I suppose the third thing that we could put in there would be that we actually trust that the Bible is sufficient to do that job. Now, I'm going to harp on the sufficiency of Scripture a lot in this course. But we, we really must trust that this book is a divinely inspired book, and it works wonders. Okay? It does what the Word of God would do if it was the Word of God. It really does, okay? So our job is to, is to read it, is to think through it, is to apply it to our lives, to obey it. Our job is always to make it our authority over our thoughts, over our inclinations. Do you remember the, uh, the episode when Jesus, uh, he'd just gone to a city and uh, they hadn't listened to him? And so two of his disciples... James and John, wanted to call down fire from heaven. You know, in their righteous indignation, they wanted to burn everybody up. That seemed like a good idea to them. That seemed like a, a godly thing to do. No doubt thinking about Elijah in the Old Testament, although it wasn't the same context at all. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You're certainly not following the spirit of Christ. In that. Yes, they rebuffed Christ. Yes, they rejected him. Yes, they were probably going about their daily business and not even thinking about the fact that the Son of God had visited them a few minutes before. Well, welcome to the world. Welcome to sin. God has put up with that for 6,000 years. So, and he puts up with that now, does he? Does he not? He puts up with it in our lives, does he not? So, um, when he speaks then into that situation, you know, if we heed it, a, a lot can happen. So we have to trust his word. So what is biblical counseling, number two? Well, the... It's using the Bible to basically do these five things. The first thing that it is, which is kind of a cover-all statement, it is, is the cure of souls. You don't hear that phrase anymore. It's an old-fashioned way of speaking about it. It actually uh, predates psychoanalysis and psychology and all of that stuff, you know. Before that, people had problems, and they used to very often come to pastors. And pastors were concerned with the cure of souls, soul sickness. There was something wrong with their soul, something went wrong with their spirit, with, with their inner being. Now, of course, when Freud and Rogers and the rest of them came along, they don't believe in that stuff. They don't believe that you have a spirit. They don't believe that you have a soul. So, uh, the idea of cure of souls kind of went out the window. We're not curing souls, we don't believe in souls. 
we're basically curing, you know, the mind, meaning the brain, and behaviors in the brain, okay? So the biblical, uh, when we're applying biblical counsel, we are concerned with the inner being, the, the heart, we're concerned with the mind, we're concerned with the spirit and the will of a person, okay? And we'll be looking at all of those those different things to understand them a little bit more. This means that those, um, those issues that are connected with the body, which produce mental problems or ab aberrant uh, behavior, okay, we need to be sensitive to that because not everything is a soul or a sin problem okay and again one of the things you're going to hear me say is that if you are counseling somebody and you, you get to to feeling that you know well, you, you got depression uh, and so on and they've described it to you one of the things you you probably should do is say have you had a checkup with a physician okay because maybe there's something wrong with them, okay? That, that maybe they've got a, a, a heart that, you know, that's not working properly. That can make people depressed. And they don't even know it, okay? Maybe they've got cancer. Maybe they've got, you know, who knows? So it's only sensible to, to understand that our job is not to treat that side of things, okay? But... The vast majority of cases that we'll be dealing with, the vast majority of people that we'll be talking to and trying to help, it will be a soul issue, which means it's going to be a sin issue. And I will talk a lot more about this stuff. You might immediately ask, does that mean that they are sinning? Not necessarily at least not in the way that we normally think about sinning, you know, willfully, hands up against God and so on, doing our own thing, being independent. No, it might not be uh, in those terms. It may well be and very often is. But sometimes it's just a wrong response to something that sin, you know, sin informs us to respond in a wrong way, like the disciples, let's call down fire from heaven, do you see? And because we responded incorrectly to something, there are knock-on effects to that. Okay, so sin is the issue, and so we've got to track that back and then say, well, okay, this is, this is what caused that, this is what caused a train of thought and a train of action and a train of thinking that brought you to this, bad habits of thinking and feeling. We've got to replace that with good habits of thinking and feeling. Do you see? This is how you should have responded. And of course, when you're saying that, you're also telling that to yourself, aren't you? If, any, if I encounter this kind of thing, this is how I need to be too. So this is another reason that this is a useful course. Secondly, um, admonition. Admonition. Um, a lot of psychology and certainly Christian psychology, which is an oxymoron, but a lot of, of Christian psychology, there is no admonition, okay? And the reason that there is no admon admonition, okay, telling a person, that's wrong. You should stop doing that. You need to stop doing that now, okay? That kind of thing. Uh, is because they've got a psychological diagnosis instead of a biblical diagnosis. You see, a biblical diagnosis is going to say, that's selfish, that's sinful. Okay? God calls that sin, you need to stop it. Whereas a psychological diagnosis is not going to diagnose it as sin, they're going to diagnose it of a problem in your past. Okay? Habits that you've uh, required, you know, you're a victim. Something like that, yes? I have a book called The Nation of Victims, which I will quote to you, not today, but 
uh, as we go by here that uh, really brings that up. You know, we've been convinced that we're, we're all victims, okay? So uh, the, uh, you may have heard of the Nuthetic Counseling, Jay Adams and, and people like that. Um, that verb nuthateo just means admonition. So that's, uh, it involves admonition. Doesn't mean that's the only thing that you do, but it's certainly something that's important. You have to be in a position to point somebody to the, to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. This is what you need to do. Okay? It's not, it's not your authority, is it? All you're doing is you're helping another person see what they need to do. And we all need that. The next thing that biblical counseling is, is just discipleship, is it not? I mean, we're just learning to follow Jesus. Um, it'd be so nice to have Jesus as our personal biblical counselor. You know, we could ask him, we could you know, ask him what to do. I'm feeling angry or I, I have this problem here with my relationships or I have this, uh, this compulsion or whatever it might be. And just a word from Jesus, you think it would sort it out. Of course it wouldn't. It would be great to hear from him. It doesn't mean you'd change. Have you read the Bible? <laughs> that doesn't always happen, does it? Uh, we have the words of Jesus. Okay? We have the word of God. It is as good, it is as authoritative as if Jesus was speaking right in front of you. Okay? So for this discipleship, that's an ongoing learning process. A disciple is a learner. And we all have to relearn, don't we? Uh, the next thing that it is, it's just reminding people. Just reminding each other of what we already know. We know that the Bible says, you know, be a peacemaker. We know that the Bible says put others in front of our, ourselves and our own desires. But we need to be reminded of that all the time, do we not? So that's part of biblical counseling. Biblical counseling is... is uh, Listening, identifying, and then saying, well, I can see here that what seems to me be doing uh, in this, in this uh, scenario that you've just described to me, you seem to have acted for yourself. You seem to have gotten angry because somebody, you know, he said that to you, she said that to you, okay? And, and you got angry and you felt, right and righteous and getting angry. And then once you're angry, you, feel, you want to be, you want to keep angry to justify yourself being angry in the first place. But how much of that anger, when we, re, when we calm down, how much of that anger is justified? How much of that anger would, would God put up with if, he, if you were being angry right in front of him? Very, very little of it, because very little, little of our anger is actually righteous anger. Okay? When God is angry, he is indignant righteously. When we're angry, we're very often angry because we're putting ourselves first and we're not willing to humble ourselves and we're not willing to just be, be meek, that's the word, be meek and take it. Okay? Let me just show you if I can find this. It's when Aaron and Miriam, 12 actually, yeah, 12. Let's, let's just, just read it together. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now you can see this is an insertion not by Moses, but by somebody else later on. Now, the man Moses was very humble. The idea there is meek, actually. Meekness is, is being willing to take duress, okay? More than all men who were on the face of the earth. 
Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the, uh, the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. So what's God doing there? He's clarifying that, look, you may be prophets and prophetesses, but I don't speak face to face with you. Okay? So putting yourself on the same level as Moses is, uh, you know, it's just not going to wash. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings, for he sees the form of God. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the um, repercussions follow. So, can you imagine, though, Moses' predicament? Because please don't think that, um, that his brother and his sister turned against him uh, in private they almost certainly did it in public. So they are, straight away, they're questioning his leadership, they are questioning his authority, and they are jeopardizing the, you know, the whole plan of God in the, the, uh, the Exodus wanderings. And do you think that as soon as they said that, then God appeared, just to fix it. Probably not. Probably Moses had to wait, you know, an excruciatingly long period, or what seemed like that to him. He was probably embarrassed. He was probably a little annoyed. He was probably wondering, what on earth can I do about this? You know, is this mutiny? What's going to happen? You know, how can I lead these people like God has told me to lead them if my lieutenants, as it were, in my own family are against me? And remember what it was about. He, hasn't, he hadn't taught any wrong teachings. He hadn't done anything willfully. He just married a woman who they didn't approve of. So... We meet situations where our motives get questioned and we want to be defensive, okay? But we need to be like Moses. We uh, get misunderstood and it hurts us, but we need to be like Moses. We need to take it. Do you see? We need to take it. It's, it's so important that we understand uh, that you cannot separate biblical character and what the Bible says we should be uh, from uh, biblical counseling. So reminding people, and then lastly, pointing to the light. We always point people to Christ. We always point people to the truth. We never just say, stop it. We also say, you can stop that, but you need to start doing that. Do you see? That's very important. So you point people to the light. This is what God says. And if you do that, it's not always easy. It always sounds easy. Okay? You can say, very often, you can, you can say what the Bible says says is a, is a kind of a remedy to it. You can say it in a few seconds sometimes. But doing it is not easy. But, you know, all things are possible in Christ. Doesn't the Bible say that? I mean, some of us really love that verse. Okay? Well, we should claim it when we're in trouble and not just when things are going well. All right, so um, 
I have here a little note after two about uh, the Bob Gans. They're um, a group of, or, or two people, husband and wife, who have written several books. Well, this is one of them called Psycho Heresy. Um, there are several others as well. And um, there are others, many others that have written um, books criticizing psychotherapy. But the Bobgans also have, have criticized biblical counseling, the newthetic type of counseling of Jay Adams and so on. They used to be more behind it, now they're, they are less enthusiastic about it. So I just want to, to uh, take some time talking about some of their criticisms, mainly of psychology and psychotherapy, so that you understand um, you know, why we're biblical counselors and why we're not interested in Christian psychology or secular psychology. Not, not all biblical counselors, just because they use the Bible, are good. Same as not all Bible teachers, just because they use the Bible, are good. Um, some biblical counselors actually cause a lot of trouble. Why? Because they don't treat people as people. They don't treat people as, as faulty, as, you know, a work in progress. They're too quick to condemn and too quick to admonish them to do something that they're not ready to do yet. They're too quick to prescribe the problem or oh, sorry, diagnose the problem and prescribe a problem, a, a substitute for it, instead of actually listening to find out, you know, what the problem is, or if there's something else, or if that really is the problem. Because very often a person might come to you and they might share something that they're hurt about or troubled by, and that's actually not the problem. They might think it is, but there may be uh, something else that's in the background okay, that is kind of playing uh, with their heartstrings and with their emotions and doing its work. And you need to kind of understand that. Okay? You can't always deal with that, but you need to understand it so that you can tell them, okay, you've got to draw a line and move forward with Christ. Okay? But you have to understand what the issue is. Otherwise, you, you might wrongly just and, and shallowly use the Bible with them and be ineffectual. So any questions about, about those things? Yes, Susan. You just listen. Um, I don't have it on here, but uh, if you had the second page, then the second page would, uh, would have uh, in part three, okay, which I haven't given you yet. Okay. Part three, uh, number two, says listen, listen, and listen again. Okay. <laughs> And then it says, listen to what they say, listen for things that don't fit, listen for things that are repeated, listen for whether they accept any specific fault, listen for signs of humility and or pride, especially pride. Okay, but listen, listen, listen. Okay, it's very important. Um, you don't have to, you, know, you don't have to listen like, uh, you know, the, the Hollywood ideal of uh, the psychologist in his chair, you know, with his pen tapping against his teeth. Uh, you know, like that. You, you, you just listen to them as a human being, okay? But you, you pay attention to them. You, you give them both of your ears and you pay attention to what they're saying, okay? And after a while, what you'll do is you, you'll, you'll, you'll start to pick up on some things. You'll start to think, hold on, they've repeated that. Or she, she got emotional when she said that. Okay, and make a little note maybe, and you come back to it. Okay, 
or that doesn't fit. Why did he put that in there? I didn't ask him about that, and he's not talking about that, but he put it in there. Okay, I need to come back to that, do you see? That kind of thing. 